I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, wasn't sure that I could do it in Florida. And so DC was a fire, you know, that was lit underneath me to become an entrepreneur. And it has continued to support me in that way for almost 26 years. This is Karen Baker, and you are about to experience artistry. Stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of Artistry, where art meets industry. We are your hosts, Rochelle Etienne Robinson and Stan Substantial Robinson. Welcome to another episode of Artistry. Today's guest is none other than strategic marketing advisor, consultant, professor, radio host, producer, and maker. Boom. Karen Baker. (laughs) <laughs> yes welcome hey family how y'all doing we yeah, are wonderful thank thanks you for, so much yeah, absolutely thanks for coming on the show yeah i'm excited to be here this is really cool congratulations thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you been keeping busy <laughs> yeah that's the truth <laughs> we have to you know yeah, as creators you your mind you know continues to go and so you mm-hmm. have to make sure that you do as well absolutely, absolutely. Jinx. <laughs> so let's um, let's start from. I always love to start from the beginning. You know, get your backstory. So you grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is another chocolate city. And you no, know, currently yeah. you're in D.C. How would you compare and contrast your experience and your time being in Fort Lauderdale versus D.C.? That's a great question because there is definitely a contrast. Uh, you know, it it. Definitely is a a chocolate city, but it was such a mix of uh, Caribbean culture Mm -hmm. infused in um, Fort Lauderdale to the point that, I mean, it was just normal, you know, for me. And then coming here to D.C., you know, it was black folk. (laughs) <laughs> Let me right. say that there right. wasn't a lot of diversity really at the end of the end of the day. Um, and I, it, it was beautiful to me. It was mm. really beautiful to me. And it was um, strong cultural unity community, you know, in that sense. And I came to go to Howard University. So those mm. two mixed together was a strong force. It really was the next level of shaping who I am and how I became you know, um, the adult that I am right now. I think D.C. really shaped me in that way. Mm. Uh, I mean, you've made roots here, too. Like you've um, since being here, you even though not being born and bred here, but you have are very much an active resident and have been involved in several programs, uh, nonprofits. As an educator, you worked with George Washington University. How would you say you have um, developed, and you, you talked about it briefly, how you have developed as, as a business owner. Yeah, I think that's where it comes in what DC has shaped me because I think, you know, coming from Fort Lauderdale, most, a lot of people were moving towards education. Uh, a lot of people that graduated from high school, they were going towards being educated, which was really good. I, it, it, in hindsight, it has shaped why I'm in education um, mm-hmm. because that was a big thing to do to uh, be an educator. Um, Mm -hmm. there in, in what we would call Broward County. Um, so coming here, what shaped me was a lot of people were entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were owning their own businesses and you were seeing that, you know, from the stores that you were walking into, to, um, people having what we probably would say e-commerce now, but that wasn't a word that we were using at the time, you know, or people were makers, you know, where we again weren't really using it at that time either. But people had owned their own, you know, which again was a huge part of just naturally seeing that. I think I didn't really discover, you know, you, you go back as you start to develop your career on how your family has influenced what you do. And it, it took longer for me to recognize how that was rooted in my history already. Um, mm-hmm. Just like politics is rooted in, in my history. And, you know, I'll share that as well. It's a huge part of the legacy of, of my family. Um, mm-hmm. And ownership of land is a huge part of the legacy of my family. But mm-hmm. that's where D.C., started to shape me as a business owner. Um, I was thinking about this this morning, so it was a great time. And in the question, I was like, it was never a thought for me not to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, wasn't sure that I could do it in Florida. And so D.C. just was a fire, 
you know, that was lit underneath me to become an entrepreneur. And it has continued to support me in that way for almost 26 years. What do you think was the the difference like between the two regions? Like what stoked the, the entrepreneurial spirit of this area versus what you were seeing back home? You know, and, and I mean, that's, that is another good question, too. I, you know, I have to when I think back, I think it's just I just didn't see it. You mm. know, I think I just didn't see it. But but when I look back now, I saw it more amongst um, not only African-Americans, but Caribbean-Americans um, as well. And then those who were coming to Fort Lauderdale, you know, they would own the you know, the stores or the uh, kind of what you would be consider a boutique grocery now um, right. would own that as well. Or the sidewalk type of uh, farming, you know, would be yeah. another thing that they would own as well, too. So, again, you just don't recognize how things shape you, how, you know, um, your eyes pass through something or you experience something and it sticks with you or stays with you in that particular way. Mm -hmm. But I think that that was it. But when you come to D.C., you start to see more brick and mortar you know, more retail, right. you right. know, that is sitting from block to block to block to block um, mm -hmm. is what I saw. And again, you know, the density of D.C. Yeah. probably made it more in my face, you know, where Fort Lauderdale is really a large amount of space. Mm -hmm. And you'd right. have to travel multiple places to kind of gather that where D.C. is right in front of you. Right. right. Yeah, I feel like D.C. feels uh, sometimes feels bigger than it actually is. Absolutely. Right. Like like it's easy to forget that it's only 17 square miles. Right. Like, yeah. it just feels larger than life. Yeah. 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 Speaking of which, you mentioned the Caribbean influence. Is your family from the Caribbean? No, but it has had a huge influence just because of where I'm where we lived and how, mm -hmm. you know, is wherever you socialize and, you know, again, where you eat and what you, you know, buy and, and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. and it was interesting, you know, growing up, I remember people who were, would come straight to uh, high school from Jamaica and initially not being proud, you know, of their heritage and where they came mm -hmm. from because of differences of dialect, you know, mm -hmm. having quote unquote an accent, you know, right. and not sure how to blend in, you know, to that as well. And then those who were coming who were absolutely proud, you know, and would stand mm -hmm. up for it as well. It was, it was interesting watching that dynamic, you know, when you're part of a community that everybody sounds and looks like you, you don't have to go through that. You know, right. Yeah. right. right. Hmm. So let's talk about your family heritage. Um, is your family originally from Fort Lauderdale? Yeah, Jacksonville in particular. Wow. OK. Yeah. yeah. What was that experience like for them? I mean, growing up, did you grow up in Jacksonville and then eventually move to Fort Lauderdale or? Yeah, I was very young, though. I think my parents moved when we were about between the ages of three and five. I actually have three other siblings. So it's four of us, gotcha. all girls. And uh, we moved to Fort Lauderdale young. Um, so we did, we had to learn about Jacksonville and the culture that it has. So, you know, I talked about the land, you know, my aunt, my great aunt owned over 200 acres of land. Wow. Mm. We played summers there, not even recognizing, again, that level of ownership. You know, right. we just saw right. her working very hard. She must have been like four nine, four eleven. Wow. wow. She was, yeah, but she would <laughs> cut some sugar cane down <laughs> and, and was selling all she was growing, you wow. know, um, but she owned all of that land and left that land to her, her children who took care of that land and only have sold por portions of that land as well. So they kept a legacy, you know, wow. alive. And then, um, her sister, who was my great grandmother, had land as well, too. You know, we would experience, you know, go straight outside, pick the egg, bring the chicken's neck, bring it in. And that's what you would have for breakfast and, and, and dinner. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's like you, you keep, you know, I, you have to say to yourself, well, why do I like farmland and why do I like agriculture? Because all of this was part of me, you know, right. growing right. up, you know, and then um, one of my great uncles which is a really huge deal. Last year, the United States Postal Service named a post office after him. Wow. Um, because wow. he was so involved in the civil rights, uh, true activist, you know, during the time of Mega Evers, 
and um, was wow. killed as a result of his work. He was his car was bombed across a bridge. And uh, so, again, that 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 has sh- is really showing up in my life, you know, wow. of, of the the foundation has been laid for generations that are before me and some are still here. Wow, That's amazing. I think um, people tend to forget, you know, they think when they hear civil rights, they think, oh, that's something that happened decades ago. But yet, as we've seen in current events, that those same struggles that were going on then are still very much alive and well today may not yes. be at the same level. Yeah. But um, to see how things have been compacted and we'll talk more about that. But, you know, just to seeing how, you know, that legacy is still alive and well in all of us. And unfortunately for some are still experiencing those same things mm-hmm. that our ancestors or our elders experienced. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, despite the ugliness of it all. I think that if you have the yeah. opportunity to remember, mm-hmm. you know, that stands the pride in how you actually deliver, you know, right. mm-hmm. or take part. Absolutely. Right. So at Howard, you know, um, HU, uh, you received your bachelor's of arts in political science from Howard. And then you also received um, a master's in administration in event management. Um, Upon graduating, where did you, where did uh, your journey take you? Um, When I left Howard, I went into education. Um, I started teaching at an elementary school here in D.C., Adams Elementary School, which at the time had the largest diversity. Uh, I think we had over 30 different uh, countries represented in that school alone. Wow. Wow. It was the only school in Washington, D.C. that had what you would consider now truly diversity within that school. Uh, I think every food that you could actually try Ethnically, I tried (laughs) because I had everybody within that school. So to be 22 years old, have that level of exposure to young people coming from all different places Mm -hmm. was a really great, great experience. You know, it wasn't the path I initially chose was to go into education, um, but I did. And and the the year, two years that I spent there, really, again, it shaped me wanting to be an educator, which I did not see in my path at that time. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I did that and, and said entertainment was my passion. So I fought hard to get into that world. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, that's where I spent quite a bit of time as well, too. Yeah. Um, so what did you do? Um What was, how did you know it was time to leave education? And then what steps did you take? Um, You said you had to fight to get into it. So what steps did you take? Um, I left education because I was so involved with my children. And um, Mm. I had fifth grade. And if anybody knows about fifth grade, Mm. hormonals, (laughs) Lord have mercy. I was, (laughs) I said, they were at my house. They were sleeping over. I was, you know, involved with the parents. It was just, you know, I was like, okay. This is something I don't know that I'm ready for now, you know, to be this involved as I am. So I said, let me get back on the path. And I'm sure this will show back up again, which it has. And so, you know, the fight to get into entertainment, you know, I think women who are in entertainment understand it's not an easy path to take. You know, um, it may be a little better than it was, (laughs) but it was extremely difficult at that time to not just go in and be somebody's administrative assistant, you know, and really want to have a true title. You know, that's why I ended up going to get a master's degree at George Washington in event management, because I'm a believer that, you know, how do you get around the stereotypes and educating yourself can be one. Right. You know, so that's what I did in order to come out with a master's degree, you know, that was very much a niche. Very few people had it at the time. Mm -hmm. And the minute I came out with it, you know, automatically went into working for black entertainment television. Yes. Back when it was still in D.C. (laughs) When it was still in D.C. And what a wonderful group of folk to work with at that time. Still friends with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Um, because we really formed a family, you know, we helped shape each other's careers at that time. A lot of people came in and didn't have a lot of experience, 
you know, but BET gave you the opportunity to get the experience, right. you know, at that right. time too. It's just something I'll never forget, you know, and I always will cherish. Awesome. What do you feel like are like the key strategies um, in having an event or a cultural event uh, specifically? Um, like what, what do you feel like are key strategies in making those events successful based on your, um, your experience? You know, I think that the, the, the biggest thing that I have learned and, and I, that I teach to that I have is, you know, not to have that cookie cutter check the list type of approach. Mm-hmm. That may have worked before. It doesn't work any anymore. Um, you know, you have to learn to design an experience. That's part of the strategy, mm-hmm. you know. And in order to design that experience, you may have to take yourself out of the equation, which sometimes is very hard when you have a vision. Right. Uh, because people come to enjoy themselves and they have a checklist, you mm-hmm. know. So from a strategic standpoint, you have to know who the audience is that's coming to attend what you have. Um, and it doesn't discount the fact that you have an idea or a vision, but it may shift mm-hmm. as right. you start to really talk to the people that are coming to pay their dollars, mm-hmm. uh, support the brand that you have, truly um, bring awareness to whatever sponsors you have, you know, things like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you do not lead with, I am here to design an experience and this is the event that will do that. Mm -hmm. then I think that you will continue to, you'll also be bored yourself. You know, you'll be bored yourself. I think because sometimes event planners, they so they're so busy checking the box that they forget that the creative part of them exists. And the reason why they're even interested in being in this industry. Right. Mm. That's awesome. That's powerful. Wearing your advocacy hat and your political science background and your event planning, those who are familiar with the Don't Mute DC movement that happened last year, you were very much involved with um, events around that. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, watching Don't Mute DC and it birthing and, and, and coming about, you know, I remember going out to the one when they had the the mobile store on the corner and, you know, won that portion of it. And, you know, I remember saying to Kimon and Ron, I was like, y'all know this is that's not this not over. Right. Right. <laughs> this is just the right. beginning. And I said, you know, I hope you all have a really strong strategy to be able to do what's next? And Ron was like, I absolutely do. I'm like, okay, good. I'm ready. <laughs> watch, go <gonna> watch, <laughs> go support and whatever needs to be done. Mm. But when I had the opportunity last summer to return go to Fort DuPont summer concert series mm. was the time that we were able to really give love back to the go-go community, its tradition and its heritage and its richness of this city. Mm-hmm. And, um, 17,000 people showing up at Fort DuPont Summer Concert Series was, it was overwhelming. It still wow. gives me that chill to watch wow. all those people come out there and light those candles up and not a fight occur, nothing to go down, you know, and to just be so, when you talk about an experience, you know, the people designed that experience. We never could have imagined. Right. That that amount of people were going to come out, but it showed the love for this culture and what this music does, you know, for the culture. Right. Wow. It was amazing to witness, to be able to see, you know, from the background, like, wow, to see all these people come. Because if you again, if you're from the DMV area, um, of course, you know, birth in D.C., but because Northern Virginia and, of course, Maryland is right outside, um, you hear you hear go go. I mean, as far as, you know, Richmond, as north as Philly, like, you know, we've had major artists, you know, Salt and Pepper, of course, most uh, most familiar. Um, Jill Scott has used Go Go Kid and Play. That's right. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. It's definitely. And Even MC Hammer had a go-go song. Yeah, that's right. People forget about that. You know what I mean? Even MC Hammer had a go-go song. Oh, God. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, a, it's not anything new. And, right. you know, my nonprofit is, is now in partnership with uh, um, the Mochella part of, of, of go-go. We're, we're supporting mm. them to help them really uh use it in education right Mm -hmm. now so it was uh very honored to be able to support them in any way that we could um Mm -hmm. because it wasn't 
just about the concerts only or the shows that they were putting on, you know, they, the, the city silenced that voice of that music. Right. Right. You know, they really silenced the voice of that music. And I remember asking a question last summer when we were in a part pl- uh, planning it. You know, I said, how did you all let this happen? I-, I just really would like to know. I've been here 31 years. I really would like to know how you all let this happen. And I told him, I said, because where if Fort Lauderdale allowed them to get rid of bass music, they'd tear that place up. Right. <laughs> right. They right. would tear it up. I said, so the charge to you is to not allow this to happen again. You know, right. not allow government or a change in a community or like people want to say the G word, gentrification, to push out a music that had roots are embedded in this city. Right. right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's ridiculous that that even has to be a conversation, right? Like yeah. can, we can't even imagine something like that happening in a city like New Orleans, right? Yeah, like, exactly. You know, um, and I think I think maybe part of the reason um, that it even got as far as it got um, or as bad as it was is largely because of the fact that when we think of New Orleans and you think of jazz, like that's a that's a worldwide phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. And even though um Gogo has had uh, some some na- uh, like some national success, um I don't I think it's we can all safely say that it really hasn't as a music scene a huge international like, you know, I mean just like a boom, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um and so and you know how it is when you're in a fight um, and there's not a lot of you, right? Like, because, um, again, D.C. is a place that feels bigger than it really is. And I think mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of times when we're in these fights, like having that international voice versus just having that. I mean, the local voice has to lead it. Mm-hmm. But but absolutely having a national voice, having an international voice, all of these things coming um, coming into play, um, you know, strength in numbers every time. Um, yeah. I think I think that's what we're starting to see with this movement um, that's happening in the U.S. right now, too, mm-hmm. um, as well uh, with um, police brutality. Uh, like when you're seeing protests in Berlin, I'm, I'm seeing like protests in Tokyo, all like just finally like people are really, really acknowledging like Correct. what's happening. So, um, yeah, I think I think it'll be interesting just to see as it uh, as it grows over the years. Um you know, like just how it's, I guess, interpreted by the world, not just here. You know what I mean? Just to help yeah. protect it. You and, know? you know, D.C. is such a transit city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, it turns over with elections. Yeah. You right. know, politics Absolutely. is a huge driver, yes. you know, of this city. And I guess, you know, also the music would with it. Because, again, the po- question that I posed, I posed to you know, people in their 60s, you know, who Mm -hmm. were part of the, you know, the 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 coming up of Mm -hmm. of of go go music, you know, and a lot of them, you know, the answer, some couldn't answer, but some had answers very similar to yours in that, you know, it staying here was Mm -hmm. part of the thing that may have at the time felt right. So made it easier for people to let it go. You right. know, or, or to not right. fight as hard for because of that. And that's Absolutely. that's what I heard a lot from people who were in their 60s, almost 70 years old is the reason why they think that it was able to be encapsulated, picked up and, you know, moved on, you know, right. within the political climate of the city because it wrapped up in the climate of the city. Right. 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 Yeah. Mm. You mentioned um, your nonprofit and I think um what we were just talking about ties that in with, with unfortunately, in order to show value for certain programs, um, movements, you have to be able to quantify it and qualify it and produce data. Um, as a nonprofit executive, speak to us about a little bit about your nonprofit and what programs that you've been able to produce uh, for the city. You know, Social Art and Culture is a nonprofit organization. And when we formed the nonprofit, we decided that it was going to be, I I guess you would use a catalyst or the bridge between other nonprofit organizations where we saw gaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were going to come in to collaborate. We were coming in to stand alone as a nonprofit. So in doing so, it makes for stronger numbers when you talk about data and value right? Uh, because we'll partner with another 
project or cause um, that may not necessarily be a 501c3 already, or we'll partner with one that is a 50c3 one, and we'll go after things together um, to show the, the impact that can be made, one, with collaboration and the impact that can be made um, with numbers. Right. Um, and, you know, social art and culture, we made the decision that its focus would be people of color. And so in doing that, we knew that we needed to collaborate in order to make sure that the um, mission and vision of the, the, the project, the cause of the other nonprofit organization wasn't minimized, right. you know, and it was birthed out of the Black Love Festival. And, you know, black may be good to say, but it wasn't good to say 20 years ago when the Black Love Festival was started. The amount right. of people that told us to change the name. And if you drop that black part, then maybe people will give you all some money. So part of it was having this song to the value that we right. knew that we offered and not to give that up despite people's being people being uncomfortable mm -hmm. about right. what the name actually brought to the table. So the programs that we've done is we, we've done a, the collaboration with uh, We Act Radio with the media arts training program during the summer through the summer youth employment program. Um, we've done a collaboration with um, a Dinkra, the Dinkra group in mm -hmm. trying to do the um, Ghana trip that yep. right. they went through. So we granted together to try to make him stronger to get the funding that he needed. Then, like I said, the Mochella. Now we're doing the same thing with them, too. So that's what we do for social art and culture. Um, right. Try to support other programs. We did the Deanwood program last summer with mm -hmm. uh, Guerrilla Arts, Inc., uh, mm -hmm. as well, too, in order to raise awareness about what was missing in Deanwood from an arts perspective. So that is the, that's the model for social art and culture. Um, don't everybody start calling me about you need a 501c3, please. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Right. <laughs> Disclaimer. <Right. laughs> but that's, that's the model that we have used in order to make sure that social art and culture is now 10 and a half years old. Wow. Um, congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you mentioned WEAC Radio. You are the creative producer of Behind the Mind Radio Show. Tell us about that. When did that get started and what are some of the themes or programs that you have through the radio show? So Behind the Mind radio show um, was birthed as I was finishing up my second master's degree in design thinking, um, which again was, you know, seeking out another degree in which I was like, OK, I reached the ceiling on one part, <laughs> need to climb a ceiling on the next part. Right. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> when I went into that degree, I was like, OK, maybe I made a mistake. I don't know what I've gotten myself into. This was not a subject matter that was known in the United States. It was very mm -hmm. big in the UK, but not a lot of people knew about it in the United States. So as a result, it was very small in number, the amount of African-Americans that were using design thinking. So it was about three of us in the program <laughs> that were actually African-American. And then as you started to filter through the community, there were even less, you know, but you talk about a very inviting community, welcoming, glad to see, because again, it was very small in the United States. So when we came out, I was like, okay, how do you come out of this and really be an expert? You know, and the radio show is what I came up with. Um, I was like, this is a way to really give not only an opportunity to those who are using this methodology, but also an opportunity for my voice and Anthony's voice to be heard and what we have just learned um, as well. So we just went into our eighth season with this radio show. So seven years, I did not think it would be that long that I would be doing this radio show. Wow. But it is definitely a light every Friday, you know, that we do it. But we interview people from all over the world, literally. Uh, we have across this globe who use that methodology in business, from every industry that you can name. Um, and so the theme is really social impact. Those that mm -hmm. are um, being innovators or designers and bringing things to the marketplace that are going to change a community, going to change someone's life, you know, going to change how they look, you know, at a, a 
ET as well. So it, we've met some very exciting people, really exciting people. Wow. Obviously, the world's in a very unique place right now. Um, before we were seeing uh, these uprisings uh, because of um, police and um, and our people, uh, we were already dealing with this pandemic and we're still like, you know, it's easy to forget, I guess, when you see so many uprisings and protests happening that yeah. we're actually in a pandemic and certain places are still on lockdown. Yeah. So that being said, like what uh, what's some of the advice you would have for like fellow creatives at a time like now? Because more than likely, even though they're starting to lift certain things, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's very likely uh, you know, this could be the situation for a very long time. So what advice do you have for creatives in this time? You know, I said, I think I said this in the beginning. I was like, you know, I'm look, I'm, I'm excited to see dope shit. That's what I'm yeah. excited to be, see, you yeah, know? Absolutely. So at the end of the day, people going to have to keep creating and mm-hmm. really push themselves and push the envelope. But I, I'm really proud of the creative community and the things that they have done, whether it's art, design, entertainment, mm-hmm. handmade things, you know, mm-hmm. really proud of what people have done. I mean, this may not have been what people have planned on being the, the the push for them to do things that they haven't done, you know, where there may have been seemed like a very small population or a small window to do something that people had. Seen. But maybe this is the push that people needed, you know, in that yeah, sure. in, in this space. So I think that people are going to have to remember the uncomfortableness mm-hmm. that they felt in Mm -hmm. order to do the thing that they're doing now, you know, um, because when you are uncomfortable, there are things that you do that you're like, why did I have to get there to do it? But I did it, you know, so that feeling may be the feeling that people have to maintain. And I have to tell myself the same, you know, don't, Mm -hmm. don't get a level of complacency or comfortable with the way that things are, even with the wearing of the mask, you know, because you're going to have to, how do you do you change this situation? How do you make sure people benefit from it? How do you build stronger? You know, how do you design better, you know, right. and what you have um, or what you've been doing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you foresee as far as um, what do you think events, particularly outdoor events, what will they look like post pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, I'm trying to think about that now with the outdoor events that I have on my plate for this year. I, I don't think people are going to see outdoor events probably until next summer, really. Um, right. Not in the capacity of, of large scale outdoor events. Right. right. Um, I think the initial of the try may be there, you know, like people are going to try it and let's see. But as soon as there's a, a setback, it's going to kill it, you right. know. Right. So, right. you know, the event industry it has really been trying to figure out how do we pivot this? Because what I do know about humans is that we need the interaction. You know, this is Absolutely. good. This is great for now, but we need to, to be in front of one another. Right. Um, the interview a couple of weeks ago with the pop critic from the Washington post Richards, him and I just, we gel because he was saying that that thump, of the music that you hear in the club, that mm-hmm. thump that you hear at that con, you know, that is going to eventually wear on people, you know, right. live theater, you know, in yeah. that particular way, you know, and that experience of it, people are going to need that back. So I do think it will come back. I really right. do. I, I, mm-hmm. It's just a matter of how patient people are going to be able to be. And that I can't, I can't answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, No, I was just going to say, and from the funding perspective, you know, as, you know, grants administrators, we, the NEA and other foundations are going to have to, may have to provide an additional um, funding source for either some form of capital improvement. I know a lot of funders don't typically um, do that, but in this case, you know, where theaters will have to reduce seating yep. or might have to add barriers or whatever, like they're going to need resources for that. And I'm Correct. just hoping that they they take heed to that. Yeah, they're going to have to, because at the end of the day, you know, you, you're talking about potentially knocking things down, but like two thirds, right. not even half in some place, like two thirds down in capacity. Right. right. You know, and what is what that does, because you don't want to hit the consumer. Right. You know, it's not their fault, 
yeah. you know, and I understand it's not the funders fault, but at the end of the day, it may lessen the amount of people that get funds because right. they're trying to increase the funds to the ones that they do actually give it to. Right. Yeah. I think another thing that's going to be affected um, that a lot of people haven't considered, and this is something that I learned via um, a conversation with my friend Funky DL, future guest of the show. He's based in London. And one of the things we had discussed um, years ago, I noticed very early on that he is not an artist who does a lot of events. Mm. Um, and I learned that partly because, you know, he saw so much in passive income that, that he didn't have to. Mm. Um, and so even I was in a situation um, like early on in the pandemic where I was asked to do like an online live event. When I saw what it was paying, you know, the the first thing I thought, well, based on what I can do myself, why would I do that? I and so, you. yeah. So now I think what's going to end up happening. So because of so many artists are now kind of forced into this other way of making a living, um, even when things do open back up. Yes, people lost a lot of money uh, from touring. But the flip side of that is you also saved a lot of money by not yeah. touring because of how expensive touring and live events can be. Correct. So um, so it's going to be interesting just to see how how um, not just audiences respond and event planners respond, but also creatives who've been able to kind of navigate the pandemic and come out in a better position um, financially versus. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm just curious what your thought might be on that. Clearly, I have some thoughts on it, but I'm just curious what you think. <laughs> no, but it's true, though, because of the artists that, you know, I have spoken with, you know, um, been sitting been part of a, a, a long trail of, of music artists here in, in the DMV um, that have been you know, doing a lot of lobbying and meeting, trying to encourage and keep one another going. You know, yeah. the, the initial thing of online for some was ex- extremely scary. You know, mm-hmm. some people were already ready for it. You know, right. they were already doing things like that, but some people really had to transition you know, yeah. into that space um, mm-hmm. and get ready for it. And, you know, talking to other agents and managers, some artists, even those who are celebrities, were not ready for it. You know, right. they weren't used to how they sound, what they needed in their home. What was that mm-hmm. going to be like? You know, they had to really get ready for it. So I think that it's, it's like it, to me, it's the same as when I'm talking to uh, a restaurant who didn't have the ability to deliver and right. was used to people only coming mm. inside and right. they then yeah. had to say, OK, now I got to get a delivery man. I got to get a car. I got to understand what curbside is. I need a line item in my budget. That type of education is going to have to happen for artists as well, too, right. because, mm. you know, there it is a new world. You know, I don't yeah. think it's a new normal. I think it's a new world. New world. So Absolutely. at the end of the day, prepare yourself because I'm a believer in passive income too. So you sleep, mm-hmm. you make, you sleep, you make. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Don't always Absolutely. use your physical body for right. everything that you have to make money in. Cause that will tire you out. Absolutely. But if you, if, if, if there begins to be a training for artists, for them to make a transition where if we are able to open back up, which I do believe we will, like I said before, into the physical space, you have mm-hmm. another means to do it so that you have two means coming in when people did not have that at all before. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm. right. What would you say are some of the most um, common mistakes creatives make when marketing their brand or product? Ooh, not understanding their audience. Mm-hmm. They just they just don't. <laughs> right. Come on, Cletus. They just don't. And, and, yeah. and I think that's just in business. You know, yeah, I've asked people 20 something years in business. Who's your audience? You see that silence? That's the silence. <laughs> right. that you get. <laughs> You're like. You don't know. It's like, oh, I I think it's the and then they start using old terms, middle class, upper class. You know, I was like, people don't use those terms no more. (laughs) That doesn't. What is that? You know, at the end of the day, that is the biggest, the biggest thing. You know, you can't just show up. You're going to have to have to ask those hard questions, which for some, it seems to be a hard question to ask. Who is your audience? You know, it goes deeper than just looking at them and thinking that, you know, who they are, because you will never know until you ask someone. Right. Right. You'll never know. 
Oh my goodness. What would you say are some examples of finding out? Like, um, would it be surveying, you know, your, is it surveying your Instagram followers? What, like, what does that look like? How do you survey? How do, How do you, you figure, figure out, out who your audience is? Yeah, and that's the simplest one. It's the easiest mm-hmm. one to do it, is the survey, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could keep it very short, five or six questions, what we would call demographic questions. You know, mm-hmm. where you get deeper is what we call psychographic questions, where you start asking people how they feel and what they value and things like that. And, it, it, mm-hmm. you know, when you talk about the creative industry, you're going to have to ask those type of questions. Right. Yeah. Um, um, right. Because you 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 hold a product uh, or service that people use in that way, you know. So right. you you have to ask more than how much money do you make and are you female, male? That that that's not deep enough for that particular industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so a, a survey is the first way to ask, you know, and to use your well, use your social media platforms, you know, yeah. and right. then from that build an email list, you mm-hmm. know. Because I always tell people if social media shut down today, what would happen to you? You'd be shit out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I listen, listen. <laughs> Shell knows, right? Because we do these presentations yep. all the time, and I stress the email list so much, and mm-hmm. I always give my my cautionary tale of MySpace, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. at the time where MySpace MySpace was the biggest thing, um, I had uh, uh, two music videos on MTV. I had all these great things mm-hmm. happening, um, and then I got featured on the front page of MySpace, so instantly went up like to like half a million friends on MySpace. Mm. And and then they just kind of <laughs> just fizzled. <laughs> and Facebook became a thing. And so here, and like, and you know, and this was before pages. So Facebook yeah. like limited you to 5,000. So now how am I going to fit yeah. 500,000 into mm-hmm. a space that only allows me to have 5,000 and be able to monetize and maximize that? But like the biggest mistake I made in that moment, which, you know, ties into exactly what you're saying is not having an email list and not having that visible on my MySpace page. And then mm-hmm. shout out to Black Pan- uh, BlackPlanet.com, R.I.P. Mm-hmm. Um, and a long <laughs> list of other services that were hot for a second and mm-hmm. then faded away. Um, clearly, Facebook, you know, and some of these um, sites have a bit more staying power than yeah. the ones that came before. Uh, Because of the different business model that they have, but that's still things change. Yeah, they do. And then you, you know, you you, they turn around and uh, what was it? Was it two? Is it been two years now? Maybe a year and a half. Remember, Twitter did a cleanup. Yeah, they they Mm -hmm. cleaned up, and some people lost like a hundred thousand followers in their cleanup. I lost like twenty (laughs) thousand. Some people were knocked down five thousand. It varied, but people Mm -hmm. they didn't know that cleanup was coming. Right. Yeah. People didn't know that cleanup was coming. The first time yeah. they did the cleanup, then the cleanup was happening, you know? <laughs> so at the end of the day, you know, if you're trying to build a brand that's centered around a B2C, a business consumer, then you're going to have to do what you may feel is old school, but still very relevant, Absolutely. still very necessary, yeah. is email. It's still yeah. very relevant. It's still very necessary. One of the best things you can do is uh, establish some type of direct line to your audience. Correct. You know, correct. We always yeah. say social media is just the kind of the icing to lead people somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you have to lead them somewhere. And if, if, if all if, if social media is just social for you, I get it. But if you're trying right. to build a business and a brand off of it, you're going to have to have somewhere for people to go. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to um, segue to a different part. Um, as a maker, you are a fiber artist. Yeah. Um, can you speak to us about that? Um, that is my love. <laughs> it is my passion. Um, I started crocheting when I was like 12. My mother taught me to crochet. And it's so funny when I started to um, crochet again about eight years ago, um, I, you know, I was telling her that I was a again, and she was like, "All I do, knew how to do was to teach you to do a blanket." I said, "Well, that's all you knew how to teach me was a blanket at that time <laughs> because it was just a skill that I picked up." So when I picked it up about eight years ago, um, it was for it was therapeutic for me. It wasn't yeah. initially to be a driver for anything else but that. And uh, I did knitting because I was very interested in that as well. And a woman who was having classes at Starbucks taught me Mm. how to knit. 
And she was like, you're not going to crochet again once I teach you how to knit. I was like, not possible. That's not <laughs> Well, nice. it did. I just picked up a crochet needle just about three weeks ago. It's been seven years. So wow. <laughs> wow. I started knitting and then I started weaving um, as well, too. And really because of, I think, my, my background, I have been very interested in the history and the rituals and the traditions of fiber arts. So for me, it's more than just the maker and the handmade side of, I do love that part of it um, and, and giving it to people and then happy with it. But the rituals and traditions of the fiber arts is what started to draw me even more in like the last four, maybe five years, because I realized that kept talking to people and they thought that it was just a hobby, that it couldn't be a career. And I'm like, why not? Because right. I keep meeting people who it is a career and it's not just a hobby, but a lot of them that I did meet in that way, they were men. But, mm. but the women's conversation was always, if I could, if I could, you know, and I was like, oh, what? You can't make any money in it. I said, well, how are men making money and women aren't making money? I'm not understanding mm. what's happening. So it really has become a passion and it has become something that I'm transitioning into because I will start to get a master's in fine arts in uh, weaving in the fall of this year. So wow. that, that will be your third master's, correct? <laughs> that will be my third master's okay. and I'm, my <laughs> final degree. I promise myself. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just keeping a tally over here, you know, uh, for our listeners. I'm just making sure they're, they're following what's happening. All oh, this greatness. My <laughs> that is so, yeah, the master's degree is a master's in fine arts, which people don't know is a terminal degree. So just like a doctorate. Mm. In, in the world of art design, MFA is a terminal degree. So the degree is a brand new degree. I'm very excited about it. It's a deg- MFA in social practice. So it is public policy and art. Wow. So its purpose is for art to have a seat at the table in government and be fully uh, knowledgeable of what you're talking about, whether you're there to mm-hmm. change laws, to lobby, you know, to make sure people understand us being at the table when laws are created, that is the purpose of this uh, MFA. Awesome. Uh, wow, Karen, thank you so, so much. This has been great. Y'all made me go down memory lane. I appreciate yes. it. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, no, we appreciate you. No, this we appreciate was your amazing. Time. This was yeah. absolutely amazing. So informative. Absolutely. Um, I guess before we close out, I, one thing I, I want to make sure that I ask is, I mean, you talked about how, you know, knitting can be very therapeutic. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you save space for your mental, for, you know, with everything that's going on currently, even in work and business and life and family, mm-hmm. what do you do to save space for your mental state? That's a, that's a great way to end too. Um, meditation has been a huge part of my life. Um, you know, um, not only prayer and me being a sp- spiritual person, but when I was told I needed to meditate really just to keep, keep your mind clear, you know, um, right. and I advise it because a lot of times when you are creative in nature, you know, um, you, you your mind can just, you, you could feel like you're losing it, you know, anxiety right. and all the things that come around mental health and, and mental illness sometimes can be more heightened, you know. Mm. And so when I was, you know, told you need to, to meditate and you need to make it a daily part of your life, the challenge was put to me. That's what I did, you know, mm. and it has been a lifesaver. It really has wow. because it allows me to stay in present Mm-hmm. And what is going on? Because when you're a planner mm-hmm. and you come from the back from the planner, you so far in the future, you know, with what yeah. you want right. to do and what you plan, that it makes you nutty, you know. Yeah. So it was a way of bringing me back to being present and not trying to control what I thought was going to happen, um, yeah. which lessened anxiety that I was dealing with, you know, as I really told myself that I'm going to embrace being an artist and a designer. You know, with that came anxiety. And, and so it was like, how do I do this and, and maintain in this space? And again, not lose my mind. You know, right. What's going on? So I, I started to meditate and it's been serious in practice for almost eight years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, because I think that that's very important for, you know, not just for creators, but for everyone, especially, I mean, especially now, or if you're dealing with any type of stress, anxiety, 
depression, yeah. any of those things. So I thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Y'all are great. This is going to be exciting. I look forward to this blossoming. Yes. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Artistry, where art meets industry. This podcast has been brought to you by Substantial Art and Music. For more information, please visit www.subartmusic.com. You can also follow us on social media at Subart Music. We'll see you soon, but talk to you sooner. Peace.